In this week's lab, you will be finding the density of two liquids. One will be deionized water and the other will be an unknown liquid. For density, you will need both the volume and the mass. We will use an analytical balance to find the mass. And in one case, we will use a graduated cylinder and the other a burette to find the volume. Before you begin your lab, you should have your notebook set up. Follow your instructor's directions for how they would like to see your lab report before it is turned in. They may ask for an introduction or purpose statement, and they may ask you to write out the procedure. It's a good idea to have your data tables set up so that you can record your data as soon as it is measured. Your lab manual online on LabFlow gives you a good suggestion for what you can do, However, the arrangement is not organized ideally. It is important to recognize the difference between data and results. Your instructor may ask you to combine the data results into one section for each part, or your instructor may ask you to put all the data first and then do the results. The way my lab notebook is set up is to have the data first. For each item, you will need to record the mass and the volume that you are using. It is important that you record each measurement as it occurs and do not leave those out of your lab notebook. There are a couple of reasons for this. First of all, you may make a mistake in the calculation and if you haven't recorded the original number, you can't go back and fix it. And secondly, if you record the number that you had perceived, then you can have an idea of whether or not the number is reasonable or if you made a mistake in recording the number in the first place. For each measurement that you make, be sure to record all of the significant digits and the units. On a digital scale, such as the analytic balance, the significant figures include every one that appears on the digital scale. For an analog scale, such as on the graduated cylinder or the burette, you can record every number that you're absolutely certain of from the line markings, and you may estimate the final digit between the line markings. When you are the only person using a scale, you can tear the balance in order to waste the contents inside of a, a container that you need to do repeated measurements. In this lab, however, you will be sharing the balance with other people, and so when you tear for one setting, it won't be teared to the same amount for the next. So you will need to measure the mass of your graduated cylinder while it is empty, clean, and dry. An analytical balance is a little different from a top-loading balance in that it is so sensitive that air currents in the room can cause changes in the measurement. Right now, this is reading 34.3634 grams. However, if I am careful and close the doors, I may see a slight change in that measurement. When you are making a measurement without tearing, make sure that the balance reads zero before you place your object on the balance. In order to find density, we need to have the volume. Your lab manual doesn't provide a spot for this. You can you can find the volume in one of two ways. One way is to make sure that you're at exactly 10 milliliters, and the other is to make sure that you record precisely what the graduated cylinder says. You'll notice that this graduated cylinder has more than 10 milliliters of liquid in it. So I can use a pipette to adjust the volume to the appropriate level before I write down my 10.00 milliliters. Now that I'm at precisely 10 milliliters, I can use that as my volume. Alternatively, I can use a lower volume than 10 milliliters and just record it to the precise number of digits, two numbers after the decimal point. This will leave me with only three significant figures instead of the four that I have with 10.00.
You may notice drips on the outside of your graduated cylinder or feel that it is wet when you're moving it around. Will this add to the mass that is perceived on the analytical balance? Will this change the volume that you measure? Does it change the actual volume of the unknown liquid inside of the graduated cylinder? When you are done, be sure to empty your graduated cylinder and shake out the excess liquid so that it can begin to dry before the next class needs to make their measurements and the next student will have a clean and dry graduated cylinder. For part two, you will be using a burette with deionized water. Check with your instructor about whether you will need to clean the burette before you begin or if you can assume that it is clean. Be sure that you use deionized water and not tap water. Tap water will have a different temperature and may contain minerals that will change its density. To keep our results consistent, we will use deionized water, which should be as close to pure water as we can get for this lab. You will need to place a funnel at the top of the burette and fill it part way. It does not need to be filled to the zero marking, but needs to be filled enough so that you can make five different measurements. Be sure that the stopcock is closed before you begin adding your deionized water. Notice that the orange line goes up and down. The line is the knob to turn the valve, and this knob follows the path of the hole. So if it is up and down, the hole is open from the top of the burette down to the opening. We want to make sure that the valve is horizontal so that the burette is, uh, will not leak before we start our measurement. Initially, when we put water inside the burette, there may be small bubbles of water. As these bubbles do in fact take up space, we need to wait for them to come to the top before we make our measurements. You can speed this along by tapping the sides. Notice that the stopcock is now horizontal and closed. The valve and the tip of the burette may also contain some air bubbles, so it is important to allow a small amount of liquid to drain into a waste container before making your first measurement. This can be discarded. The markings on a burette can be difficult to read if you can see the background behind the burette. Sometimes it can be helpful to hold up a piece of paper behind or a note card behind the burette. If the markings on the burette are in white, you may want to choose a dark paper. Remember that you will read the burette from the top down. This meniscus is between 26 and 27 milliliters, so the volume I will record will be 26.2 decimal places. I will then count from the top how many lines down to the meniscus. So in this case, it looks like I am down to the sixth line. It's just below the halfway point, so it's about 26.6, not 27.4. You're reading from the top down. Now notice I said about. I have markings for the tenth of a milliliter, but I need to make sure that I am mark or that I am recording that estimated value between the lines as well. So I'm going to record this volume as 26.68. In part two, you will be determining both the mass and the volume by difference. So we need to find the mass of the empty beaker as well as the initial volume on the burette. The amount that you dispense for the water from the burette is not terribly important. Just make sure that is at least one milliliter. And that way you can make sure that you are having at least three significant figures in your calculations. Be sure to take the mass of the beaker again before your next trial. The reason for this is there will be some residual water in there, and so the mass will have changed from the empty dry beaker, even if you empty the water. Be sure to take the temperature of your water before you finish for the day in the lab. This needs to be the same water that you were using for your measurements, not tap water. You can drain your burette into the same beaker or you can add a little more from your deionized water bottle. 
turn your burette upside down with the stopcock open so that it can dry before the next class enters. Once you've collected all of your data, you can do your calculations and your analysis. You will need to find the mass and the volume for each trial. You will need to find the density. Remember that density is going to be the mass divided by the volume. Here you can see the densities that I found for my unknown liquid. Notice that while I had five or four digits for my mass, I only reported three digits or sometimes four. The reason for this is that in looking at the two numbers I'm dividing, I'm going to use the number of digits that is fewest. So in sample two, I only have three digits for my volume, and therefore I'm only going to report three digits once I start my non-zero numbers. Remember that digits are different from decimal places. The significant digits start with the first non-zero number and go until the last non-zero number or the last digit after the decimal point. It is important that I find the average density because this is what I'm going to compare to the true value. The true value for the density of your unknown will be provided by your instructor because your instructor knows what the unknown is. Your instructor is going to ask you to calculate the percent error. They may ask you to show your calculations in your lab notebook. The directions for the lab have an error in this formula. They state um, instead of experimental value, they state experimental error. So you want the value of your average density minus the accepted or true density. And these vertical bars, remember, mean the absolute value. So we're going to take the positive value if it's negative and divide that by the accepted value and, of course, multiply by 100%. For your water calculations, everything will be very similar. Your instructor may provide you with the true density or the instructor may provide you with a table for you to find the true density based on what your temperature reading was. Different sides of the lab may have slightly different temperatures, so students may have slightly different values for their true value. Your instructor may also ask you to write a summary or conclusion to the lab, answer questions, or sign your lab notebook. Be sure to verify this with your instructor before using the Rocketbook app to take a PDF of your lab entry and email it to yourself. Remember that you can use the symbols down at the bottom and identify one of those symbols as being your email address or your instructors or both. If you have a storage area like Dropbox, you can also send your file to that. 